Chapter One of the Love of Jesus to Penitents. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Love of Jesus to Penitents by Henry Edward Manning. Chapter One The Sacrament of Penance, the Special Sacrament of the Compassion of Jesus my object in the following pages is to speak of the sacrament of penance not so much as it is divinely proposed to us through the church as an object of our faith but as it is an object of our love i may therefore pass over as already known its divine institution its form its matter and its effects to use the language of our theology and to speak of it as it manifests to us the special tenderness of the love of jesus and draws us to itself by the effusion of special gifts of grace the sacrament of penance is loved by catholics and hated by the world like the pillar which of old guided the people of god to us it is all light to the world it is all darkness there are two things of which the world would fain rid itself of the day of judgment and the sacrament of penance of the former because it is searching and inevitable of the latter because it is the anticipation and the witness of judgments to come for this cause there is no evil that the world would not say of the confessional it would dethrone the eternal judge if it could therefore it spurns at the judge who sits in the tribunal of penance because he is within the reach of its heel and not only the world without the church but the world within its unity the impure the false the proud the lukewarm the worldly catholic and in a word all who are impenitent both fear and shrink from the shadow of the great white throne which falls upon them from the sacrament of penance but to all who are penitent in whatsoever degree and of whatsoever character it is an object of love next after the holy eucharist and for reasons which even the blessed sacrament of the altar does not equally present the presence of jesus in the holy eucharist is real and substantial proper and personal in all the fullness of his godhead and manhood his presence in the sacrament of penance is by representation and by grace in this then there is no comparison possible in the holy eucharist jesus manifests himself in his royalty power and glory in the sacrament of penance in his tenderness as a physician and his compassion as the good shepherd in the former he attracts and transforms us chiefly by his divine attributes in the latter by his human experience sympathy and pity in the holy eucharist jesus draws us upwards to himself in the sacrament of penance he stoops down to listen to us and to open to us his sacred heart in the midst of our sins and in the hour of our greatest miseries the holy eucharist is jesus reigning amongst the just the sacrament of penance is jesus seeking among sinners for those that are lost the former is the sacrament of saints the latter of the sinful and therefore to such as we are it comes down with a singular nearness an intimate contact with our needs and an articulate and human voice of help and solace what then i would wish to do is to set down some of the reasons why we ought to contemplate and to approach it with love the reasons i will give shall be as follows because first it is the special sacrament of the compassion of jesus secondly it is the means of self-knowledge thirdly of perfect contrition 
fourthly of reparation and lastly of perseverance number one and first i would show that it is the special sacrament of the compassion of jesus the sacrament of penance then both manifests and applies the fullness of the grace of jesus to sinners when our divine lord breathed upon the apostles and said receive ye the holy ghost whose sins you shall forgive they are forgiven and whose sins you shall retain they are retained he exempted no soul then living nor any who should afterwards come into the world from this divine commission of pardon he placed in the hands of his apostles the gift of his most precious blood wherewith to sprinkle the whole earth and the people of all ages and generations it was a commission to jew and gentile to those who then believed and to all who through their word should afterwards believe in his name it included also the greatest of sinners no man was shut out from the great mission of penance and of pardon the oldest and most inveterate sinner whose sin was red as scarlet and black as the night the most proudly impious and the most habitual in relapse all are within the terms and reach of absolution he has himself said every sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men save only one the blasphemy of the spirit shall not be forgiven because the blasphemy of the spirit is essentially a sin that is not repented of it consists in blaspheming and rejecting the lord of repentance and the very commission of forgiveness it becomes unpardonable not by a decree of the divine legislation but by the moral bar put by the sinner himself this alone accepted there is no sin of the flesh or spirit howsoever inveterate guilty or aggravated for which there is not a full a perfect and instant absolution but the sacrament of penance not only conveys pardon to all and for all sins whatsoever it also bestows upon the soul an exuberance of divine gifts as baptism is our first spiritual resurrection so if we afterwards fall into mortal sin penance is our second and therefore they are called the sacraments of the dead because they raise souls dead in sin to the life of justice and in raising the soul they fill it with grace and charity the sanctifying grace lost after baptism is restored in penance and not only so but all the works of piety and charity which through our mortal sins are mortified and die by absolution are fully revived and live again before god like as spring comes after winter and revives all things and the lands and the woods which a little while ago seemed dead put on a new vigor and fruitfulness so with the soul it was dead it is alive again and all the fruits which hung withered on the bough are quickened once more with a new life by baptism we were sons of god by sin we lost our adoption and fell from grace and charity by penance we are brought back again to friendship and sonship with our father in heaven such is the fullness of grace of which the sacrament of penance is a permanent and inexhaustible source number two another way in which the sacrament of penance manifests the compassion of jesus christ is its freeness this full perfect and universal absolution from all sins of our whole life in all their multitude and in all their guilt would be cheaply purchased by years of sorrow or by a life of penance or by loss of life itself who is there that would not do or suffer or sacrifice anything or even die if by dying he could make sure of an eternal pardon nevertheless 
it is for none of these conditions that our divine lord bestows his forgiveness on us we could not purchase it therefore he purchased it for us we were sold gratis that is betrayed and lost by sin and we are redeemed without money that is as we had not wherewith to pay he let us go and forgave us the debt and yet not till he had paid it himself according to the way of wisdom and love ordained by the father the son of god was incarnate that he might take a human life and that having taken it he might have somewhat to lay down for us no man taketh it away from me i have power to lay it down and i have power to take it up again by the passion of his whole mortal life and above all by the last act of shedding for us his most precious blood jesus purchased for us the absolution of baptism and of penance it cost him dear to institute these holy sacraments it cost us nothing for he has freely given them to us they are ours because they are his and they are his because he purchased them by the last drop of his divine blood by an act of sovereign largesse he bestows them upon us every several absolution is a royal pardon freely and abundantly bestowed not only without money and without any price but notwithstanding our great unworthiness and even more than this that we may be forgiven he requires of us at least a penitent heart and yet this penitent heart is also his gift it is by his own preventing grace that we are disposed for the sacrament of penance it is he who awakens supernatural fear by the light of faith in the reason it is he who stings the conscience with the spirit of burning and the consciousness of past sin it is he who awakens the hopes of our heavenly father's pardon and gives to the will the impulse which moves it to the confessional no man cometh to the father but by me and no man can come to me except the father who hath sent me draw him the sacrament of penance then is the sacrament of the sovereign grace of jesus and the especial channel and witness of his compassion and round about the tribunal where he sits in his royal clemency the attraction of his sweet inspiration is always moving to and fro to win souls to come to him such is the freeness with which he bestows on men the dear-bought pardon of his most precious blood number three once more the compassion of jesus shows itself in the sacrament of penance by the inexhaustible frequency with which he bestows upon us absolution after absolution the angels sinned once and fell they had no redemption no redeemer once fallen fallen to all eternity adam sinned once and fell from life and sonship he had then no sacrament of penance no baptism of regeneration but when sin entered redemption came with it and grace brought in a dispensation of forgiveness first came the virtue of penance as a condition of pardon now it is embodied in a sacrament not as it was by one sin so also is the gift for judgment indeed was by one unto condemnation but grace is of many offences unto justification for if by one man's offence death reigned through one much more they who receive abundance of grace out of the gift and of justice shall reign in life through one jesus christ adam's one sin brought death even on those who had not sinned the precious blood of jesus has brought absolution upon all men and for all sins countless as the stars of heaven there is but one baptism but there are many absolutions 
for the sacrament of penance is a fountain ever flowing perennial and inexhaustible the silver trumpets proclaim the jubilee once only in every fifty years but the precious blood cries to us in the sacrament of penance at all hours by day and by night the pool of bethsaida in jerusalem had no healing virtue save only after its waters had been stirred by the visit of an angel and then they healed but one sick man the first alone who could go down into them its porches were filled with sufferers languishing with sickness and hope deferred again and again for years the gift had been snatched from them even at the moment of arriving while they were even going down into the waters another less maimed and less in need than they were went down into the waters before them and carried away the grace to try their faith and patience god hardly opened his hand and let his power fall only by single drops upon the surface of the pool wonderful illustration and contrast the fountain opened in the heavenly jerusalem for the sin of man is open day and night always full of power and grace jesus himself is there the lord of all power healing and virtue go out from him with a divine and inexhaustible fullness it is not the first or one alone that is healed but all comers and all sufferers from all lands and at all hours and no man takes away another's absolution nor does any one need another's hand to help him go down into the pool of the most precious blood god the holy ghost is there drawing sustaining upholding the weak and maimed as they go down and are healed one by one and that not only once but seventy times seven as often as men fall so often they may return and the same precious blood cleanses and heals always as for the first time with a divine and perfect absolution jesus makes no distinction all who come with the necessary dispositions of heart are healed for all sins whatsoever sins after repentance sins after absolution sins after a long life of devotion sins in the full sunshine of his love there is but one condition sorrow and the will to sin no more and where this is absolution is sure and full number four and here again his compassion is almost more luminously shown that is in the facility of that which he requires of us as a condition to his absolute pardon it is in his sovereign gift and yet not without condition but this condition he has reduced to the least he could require st augustine says god created us without our cooperation but he will not justify us without it in our creation we were passive and unconscious in our justification we must be conscious and active if it were not so we should not be moral agents nor would our salvation be by moral means though as i have said he might have exacted the most that man can do as a condition of eternal life he requires the least which his moral law exacts in baptism he pours out upon us all his gifts of regeneration sonship justification sanctifying grace and charity while we are as yet unconscious compared with this indeed the sacrament of penance is more exacting and it was therefore called by the holy fathers baptismus laboriosus a toilsome baptism and post naufragium tabula a plank after shipwreck to show that it was the last hope to the lost nevertheless in itself it is a miracle of the facility of jesus in forgiving sinners and first all that he demands of us is to come to the sacrament of penance he sits all day long in the confessional saying 
come to me all you that labor and are burdened and i will refresh you he upbraids us for our unwillingness you will not come to me that you may have life all the day long i have spread my hands to a people that believeth not and contradicteth me he pleads with us as if we did him wrong in destroying ourselves o oh, my people what have i done to thee or in what have i molested thee answer thou me then come and accuse me saith the lord if your sins be as scarlet they shall be made white as snow if they be red as crimson they shall be white as wool less than this he could not require at least we must come to him in the sacrament of his compassion that our sins may be forgiven but i have already shown that even the disposition and the desire to come to him spring from the inspiration of his own preventing grace by which he is at all days and all hours drawing souls to himself he requires then that we should come to him and that we should bring with us at least a sorrow for our sins it would be a great insincerity and an immoral act to come to him without sorrow for having offended against him this at least we owe to him if we can do no more we can at least be sorry and yet in sorrow there are many degrees so marked that i might almost say there are many kinds reaching from the sorrow of fear to the sorrow of love from the sorrow which springs from a fear of judgment to come to the sorrow which flows from the love of the sacred heart of jesus he might justly require of us the sorrow of love but he requires of us only the sorrow of holy fear that is from any supernatural motive of faith such as of the judgment to come and of eternal death with a desire of being reconciled to him and yet this sorrow is not the sorrow of emotion and tears but the sorrow of the reason and the will that is a displeasure against our sins and against ourselves with a will to sin no more unless we have this we should be unfit for absolution for a will to sin is sin a will not to sin is the least amends we can make and this is no more than the retracting of the disobedient will whereby we have offended and the returning to our obedience as children of god together with this sorrow he requires also a truthful and humble confession a sincere self-accusation in the tribunal of penance detailing at least the sins we remember their kind their number to this must be joined a resolution to sin no more such is the state of heart he requires of us with this even the greatest of sinners with all the leprosy of his sin upon him may come to the sacrament of penance and be cleansed every whit the prodigal son after all his wantonness and all his wanderings with all his ingratitude and with the multitude of his sins upon him beggared and barefoot may return to his heavenly father with no more than a father i have sinned against heaven and he is at once forgiven this is the true facility of the pardon of jesus christ not the false and delusive heresy of justification by faith alone which the innovators of these later ages have invented but the full free and sovereign pardon with which every penitent soul is received and justified in the sacrament of the compassion of jesus christ number five there is still one more token of his compassion in this sacrament of pardon and it is the fervent desire with which he desires to absolve us of our sins he loves every several soul with all the love of his sacred heart and his whole heart is bent at every moment 
on the salvation of those that are lost he has told us that even the ninety and nine just are less present to his loving anxiety to speak as he has taught us in the parable of the lost sheep than the one sinner doing penance he seeks out such a soul by his preventing grace he surrounds encompasses envelops it with lights inspirations impulses attractions of his love and power even when we are unwilling to come to him he is yearning to draw us to himself we are distant and he presses after us we are unwilling and he is urgent by his grace we are cold and he is on fire with the love of souls we are tardy in listening and tardier in coming to him and he is ardent and importunate in the reiteration of his calls and inspirations for he desires to forgive us more than we desire to be forgiven he loves us even more than we love ourselves he thirsts for our salvation more than we desire to be saved and it is in and through and by the sacrament of penance that he unfolds to us the full tenderness and compassion of his sacred heart in the midst of our miseries and our sins such then are some of the reasons why this sacrament ought to be an object of our love it is because jesus is with us as he was with magdalene when she stood behind him weeping and with peter after he had denied him thrice in it he again receives us to his grace and love and through it he guides sustains and consoles the penitent the fearful and the tempted it is the sacrament of the presence and the love of the good shepherd and by it all that is expressed in that title of tenderness and compassion is fulfilled to us i am come that they may have life and may have it more abundantly that is with all fullness and freeness and facility again and again as often as they need and with all the fervor and generosity of the sacred heart and now this sacrament of his love to many is necessary and to all is a fountain of grace to those who after baptism have fallen into mortal sin it is of necessity no other sacrament of life remains to them no other means of rising from the dead of sin to the life of justice is ordained they cannot raise themselves to life again the charity of god has departed from them and the holy ghost has withdrawn his habitual grace the interior acts of their souls are dead their good actions have no power of merit one act of mortal sin has destroyed all one such sin in youth has cankered the root of a long life or one such sin at the close of many years has withered all the growth and fruit of the longest obedience if they so die they are lost and lost forever to die out of the love of god is eternal death how shall they be revived again except only by this second sacrament of the dead if they come with the sorrow of faith and hope even though they have not charity the compassion of jesus will give them a full forgiveness and breathe into them the breath of life once more and lastly to all even to the holiest the sacrament of penance is a fountain of grace for it is hard to know ourselves and it perfects us in self-knowledge it is hard to be generous in our sorrow and it perfects our contrition it is hard to be fervent and it gives us the spirit of mortification and courage it is hard to be steadfast and persevering and it sustains and keeps us up as by the power of the everlasting arms but of this i shall have to speak hereafter they who habitually frequent this holy sacrament live in a sweet bondage of love which is perfect freedom 
with a will elevated and confirmed in the liberty of the children of god they who spurn and neglect it seek for liberty and fall into a bondage which is heavy and bitter the sins of the heart and the sins of the tongue the temptations of the devil the yoke of the world scruples and stings of conscience fear of death and terrors of judgment to come these are the wages of those who refuse the light burden and the sweet yoke of jesus in this sacrament of his compassion end of chapter one chapter two of the love of jesus to penitents by henry edward manning this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the sacrament of penance a means of self-knowledge i have hitherto shown that the sacrament of penance is the special manifestation of the compassion of jesus as the church is the manifestation of his truth to every age so penance is the manifestation of his tenderness st cyprian calls the church sacramentum unitatis et veritatis the sacrament of unity and truth because by the supernatural unity of the church the truth is incorporated perpetuated and promulgated to the world so st optato says the heretics have not the keys which peter alone received and st augustine unity binds unity looses that is in the unity of the church alone the power of loosing from sin is found because the sacrament of penance is the only revealed channel of the pardon of jesus christ to those who fall from baptismal grace our lord in warning the church of laodicea said because thou sayest i am rich and made wealthy and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked they were lukewarm and therefore they were self-deceived and because they were self-deceived they were self-trusting they believed themselves to be possessed of light and faith and grace and knowledge of themselves and they knew not their poverty and blindness our lord invites and warns them to come to him for gold and white raiment and eye salve that is for sanctifying grace and justification and knowledge of themselves and this he bestows upon those who are fallen from their baptismal innocence in the sacrament of penance my present purpose then is to show how the sacrament of penance is the means of self-knowledge number one and first because it requires and sustains the habit of self-examination once a year at least every soul must examine its state before god under pain of sin frequent confession requires frequent self-examination daily self-examination is the daily preparation for confession which is the fruit and result of daily self-examination in this way we are bound by a strong and constraining obligation to a duty which is necessary to salvation but both unpleasant and difficult it is absolutely necessary by the necessity of a means without which there can be no salvation for without repentance salvation is impossible and without self-knowledge repentance is impossible there can be no sorrow or detestation of sins which we know not nor of acts which we do not know to be sins and yet this is an ignorance which will not excuse us it is vincible and therefore culpable again if we forget our sins god does not forget them the sins of childhood and youth and of long years past we may remember no more but they are written in the book of god's remembrance all our whole life so tangled and confused 
illegible and dark to our eyes is all clear and distinct to his it is a dangerous thing to forget our past we cannot cast it off except by penance though we forget it we can never escape from its presence it follows as a shadow noiseless but inseparable some men's sins are manifest going before to judgment and some men they follow after there is but one way to be loosed from them and that by the power of the keys to this confession is necessary and confession without self-knowledge is impossible but self-examination is not only a vital necessity it is also a painful and displeasing task there are two things which we shrink from seeing as they are god and ourselves the sanctity of god overwhelms and terrifies us the sight of our own sins and miseries galls and humbles us we have not the courage or the will to look steadily on either of these things if we catch a momentary sight of them we turn away and try to lose ourselves in the distractions of other thoughts as st james says if a man be a hearer of the word and not a doer he shall be compared to a man beholding his own countenance in a glass for he beheld himself and went his way and presently forgot what manner of man he was it wounds our self-love to see our faults the sins of commission the breaches of the ten commandments the sins of omission the neglects the ingratitude the meanness of which we have been guilty it requires a great sincerity and no little humility to look thoroughly and patiently into ourselves and to learn the worst of our hearts it disturbs our peace and breaks our self-complacency for this reason multitudes make their self-examination hastily timidly and superficially but not only is self-examination displeasing it is also very difficult for next after god nothing is more inscrutable than the heart which is made in his own likeness it is a mystery to itself it conceals itself from our sight and its motions become unconscious like the circulation of the blood it is within us and it is therefore invisible it is insensible because it is habitual it is a perpetual motion so rapid that it seems like rest the thoughts of the intelligence are as countless as the stars of the firmament the emotions of the heart are as multitudinous as the waves of the sea the volitions of the will are as inconstant and as continual as the changes and shifts of the wind the heart is perverse above all things it is a deceiver a flatterer a dreamer and a companion of the tempter the heart is a deceiver because it is ever changing it puts on a new color with its outward circumstances with its inward trials with the society in which it may be it interweaves its motives and misnames its actions the fiery persuade themselves that they are zealous the censorious that they are zealous for truth and justice the slothful and lax that they are benign it foreshortens its ends so that the ambitious believe themselves to be disinterested and the worldly to be single-eyed till they know not for what end they are acting and while they believe themselves to have only one aim in sight they have another below the horizon but more than this the heart is a flatterer it exaggerates all that it has of good such as its prayers crosses alms devotions graces much more its intentions it excuses all evil it throws the blame of its faults upon temptations upon persons upon circumstances upon everything but upon itself 
it gilds even its sins by soft names and high professions of good intentions and services rendered to god the heart is also a dreamer for it paints itself by the imagination and pictures itself to itself as a penitent in sackcloth or a saint in ecstasies it reads the lives of saints and dreams itself in their place it melts also into tears and is moved to passionate emotions before a crucifix or the blessed sacrament like as others shed tears over a tale of imaginary wrongs or of majestic beauty it puts impulses for volitions desires for intentions and intentions for deeds and last of all it is the familiar and playfellow of the tempter it listens to him and parleys with him as Achan in jericho it courts him as balaam and it houses him as judas did of such is the heart capable and every heart has the whole capacity of all this self-deceit we have need of a firm eye and an unsparing hand to search it out and unless we be sustained and even bound to this painful task few have severity enough with themselves to do it as they ought it is the sacrament of penance then which binds us to this duty and the oftener we come to it the oftener we are compelled to search out the secret workings of our hearts and to know them with a true knowledge number two again it places us in the light of the cross the reason why we all see our sinfulness so little is because we so little appreciate the sanctity of god our lives seen in the light of the world or of our own self-love or of our flattering friends are very different from the same life seen in the light of the presence of god thomas a kempis says what looks bright in the eyes of the doer looks base in the sight of the judge when isaiah saw the lord upon his throne his first consciousness was that he was a man of unclean lips daniel fell at the feet of the angel of the lord and his beauty was turned into corruption st john when in vision he saw the lord on whose bosom he had lain fell at his feet as dead it was the light of the divine presence which revealed the sin and the infirmity of even such saints as these such in its measure is the effect of the sacrament of penance upon us we kneel under the light of the ever-blessed trinity and of the incarnate word and of his holy passion and of the divine soul of jesus which in its agony expiated our imperfect contrition and of the sacred heart which gives out its illumination by the wound in the side of jesus all these lights come down upon us as we kneel in the confessional and in them we see not only ourselves our past life our present character but the law of god which we have broken its letter and its spirit what it forbids what it enjoins upon our obedience our fidelity and our generosity and by this clearer knowledge of the rule we can detect our deviations from its rectitude we never see ourselves more clearly than when we kneel under the crucifix in the sacrament of penance and the oftener we kneel there the clearer grows the light of the knowledge of self in the presence of god and at the feet of jesus christ number three and further one great hindrance to self-knowledge is the spirit of self-defense the pharisee who stood and prayed by himself thanking god that he was not as other men are is the type of those who turn from the confessional the publican is the type of the penitent upon his knees for what is the sacrament of penance but the sacrament of self-accusation 
we are all tempted to excuse ourselves when the eyes and ears of the world are open upon us we are all full of apologies or denials it needs the heroic humility of a saint to suffer and be silent like saint vincent de paul who when falsely accused in the antechamber of the king of france went down on his knees and took the shame without a word but in the confessional we can make no excuses we know that all is known to him who sits there unseen for the word of god is living and effectual and more piercing than any two-edged sword and reaching into the division of the soul and the spirit of the joints also and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart neither is there any creature invisible in his sight but all things are naked and open to his eyes to whom our speech is we know that we can suppress nothing that he saw all and heard all and knows all before we speak and that he puts our truth on trial in requiring us to tell out our whole tale against ourselves we cannot give a turn even to an expression or pass over a single point for he knows all things not a jot or a tittle may be changed for the divine scrutiny searches the heart at the time of the confession as well as at the time of the sin number four and besides this the sacrament of penance gives us the guidance of another we know well that no man can trust himself to be judge in his own case with all our profession of sincerity we are warped when we are judging of ourselves we are unconscious of our words and acts we note instantly in another the very things of which we are not aware in ourselves nay we detect the least impetuosity in others and fail to see the most headstrong passion in ourselves as our divine lord has said we can see the mote in our brother's eye and cannot perceive the beam which is in our own and therefore he has ordained the sacrament of penance in which go when we may we find at least one man in the world who is a true friend to us at least one friend who will not flatter us and more the priest in the confessional is not only an impartial judge but also a practised one like a physician who by long use knows all the symptoms of disease who can tell its premonitory signs the manifestations of its presence and the effects which it leaves behind it so is the priest who is divinely ordained to sit and judge between leprosy and leprosy and to discern whether it be only rising or in full power or departing a physician will often discover disease where no one suspects it and by signs which to others are unperceived not only the beat of the pulse and the color of the skin but its texture the light of the eyes the harshness of the hair and other such tokens give evidence of the presence of disease in like manner in the confessional long habit of dealing with the pathology of souls enables a confessor at once to discover symptoms which the penitent does not know or even imagine but further he is not only practised and his perceptions quickened by experience and use but he is also enlightened to discover even that which the penitent may not say or know there is a special light vouchsafed to those who guide souls they are moved often to say more than they are aware of and to waken up whole periods of memory and trains of thought which the penitent has either forgotten or failed to perceive sometimes a question suggests a new and truer estimate of actions which have been altogether misunderstood sometimes it seems like an intuition or a gift of supernatural insight as indeed it is sometimes perhaps consciously often unconsciously 
like men that work in mines before they are aware they strike through into open day and find themselves all of a sudden in the light of the sun the holy spirit makes use of the confessor to illuminate the penitent either by enlightening him directly or by using him to reflect a light which he hardly sees himself in these ways then they who frequent the sacrament of penance are ever advancing in a truer knowledge of themselves number five and lastly there is another light vouchsafed to them directly an illumination which falls inwardly upon the conscience from the increase of spiritual grace for as every sacrament conveys an increase of grace and every grace brings light so every time we worthily receive the sacrament of penance we receive a greater inward light self-examination prepares for the sacrament and the sacrament elevates it to a supernatural knowledge of self at the beginning we see ourselves but dimly and can discern little with truth we see men as it were trees walking but in a little while all becomes self-evident as the light of day it was by this internal light that saints have called themselves the chief of sinners that saint clare wondered that her sisters did not shun her as one stricken with the plague saint vincent ferrer used to say that he daily grew worse and worse it was this that made saint francis borgia construct what he called the ladder of confusion that is he first placed himself before the holy trinity and was overwhelmed by the contrast of the uncreated sanctity with our created infirmity next he placed himself in the light of the sacred humanity and confounded himself at the sight of his own nature so shattered and defaced then in the presence of the immaculate mother of god a mere creature though god's mother and humbled himself for the soils and stains of both original and actual sin then before the holy angels and condemned his own tardy and lingering obedience by the energy and fervour of their ministries then of the saints and by their perseverance he measured his own inconstancy then of the servants of god on earth of whom he professed himself to be the least then of the souls in purgatory of whom the least humble is more profoundly humble than any saint on earth then of the souls that are lost confessing that if they had received his grace they would have been holier and more penitent than himself such was his practice for some two hours a day during which he examined himself by the ten commandments and after each made acts of contrition for his many and grievous transgressions such was the self-examination of a saint he had no difficulty in finding matter of humiliation though he had so little we find it a hard task though we have sinned so much and why it is because our internal perceptions of god and of his kingdom are faint and dim the knowledge of god and of ourselves comes and goes and varies altogether saint francis who on mount alvernia received from the flaming seraph on the cross the five piercing rays which imprinted on him the stigmata of jesus spent the whole of a lonely night under the alternate illumination of this knowledge of god and of himself pouring out his soul in repeating o oh my god how great art thou how little am i from whence then did all these great saints receive this profound light of self-knowledge but from the life of penance of which this sacrament is the source and perfection from all that has been said two plain practical truths are evident first 
that we may never think that we know all we might of ourselves in the heart there are so many windings and doubles so many masks and disguises so many false lights so much paint upon the face and so many artificial expressions of countenance that it is certain we deceive ourselves as well as others they who know themselves best are only least deceived this we may understand by thinking how different our past life looks now at the time we thought it all fair just as we think our present life we suspected nothing wrong in things which now seem manifestly wrong we were as confident of our motives and intentions then as we are now but a few years have thrown a new light upon it all a few years hence and we shall see our present as now we see our past how different all will look upon a deathbed then a new and true light will reveal a multitude of secrets and show much that we never believed possible how different all will appear when we look back upon our earthly life from the world beyond the grave in the hour of the particular judgment and at the moment of entering purgatory and at the general judgment of the last day then all masks shall be taken off from all faces and we shall know as we are known and see as we are seen then many who have seemed to know each other parents children friends pastors penitents shall know each other for the first time and wonder at the vain show in which they lived and died we must therefore be always pressing onward in the knowledge of self with much mistrust and with a sincere desire to know the worst of ourselves and next we may learn never to fear when we see the worst of ourselves to see more sins is no sign of committing more but of greater knowledge of self and if we have more knowledge then more light and if more light then more of the presence of the holy ghost for when he comes into the heart he casts a broad light upon it but conceals himself we see ourselves not him and he reveals to us not the things which are pleasant to us but those that are displeasing to himself not our graces or prayers or good dispositions but our sins and omissions our inward faults our unstable wills our unloving hearts he reveals to us that we are poor and miserable outcast blind and naked that we may buy of him gold tried in the fire and white raiment and eye salve to open our eyes that we may see ourselves as we appear now in his sight and in the light of his eternal throne end of chapter two chapter three of the love of jesus to penitence by henry edward manning this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the sacrament of penance the means of perfecting our contrition we have seen how the sacrament of penance requires and infuses and perfects the knowledge of ourselves and next i wish to show how in like manner it requires and infuses and perfects our contrition it is not only true that they who are least contrite go less often to confession but also that they who go often become most contrite and that their contrition is elevated and matured by frequenting the sacrament of penance now it is hardly necessary to state here in words that contrition is of two kinds the contrition of fear and the contrition of love but in the production of this sorrow there are many distinct motives progressive in their operation 
and ascending in their kind from the lowest sorrow which is necessary to the sacrament to the highest which is a special gift of god number one and first there is a sorrow which springs from the knowledge of our sins this is the first and lowest motive of contrition the deadliness and baseness of our sins seen in the light of the presence of god but at the outset of our conversion or life of penance our sins though they be so many all seem as one they are all mingled in confusion and they conceal each other and themselves by their multitude and their complication a mountain of sand and a heap of stones seems to us at first to be but one object it is only as we draw near to them and begin to look into them and to separate the grains and the stones that we begin to find their number moreover so long as the effects of a sinful or of a worldly life are upon the heart it is stunned and dim-sighted it is only gradually that we begin to see the innumerable multitude of our sins and then they seem to us to surpass all number as we draw near to them they disengage themselves and stand out one by one and what we once thought from a distance to be but one separates itself into an infinity of particles so our sins stand out each one in its distinctness of kind of number and of circumstance and as this process is advancing so also our sorrow is increasing we had in the beginning a sorrow for the sin of our life seen in the tangle and confusion of our first conversion but now we feel a sorrow for each as we remember them one by one and a greater sorrow it may be for each one by one than before we felt for all together i have already attempted to describe this process of growing illumination by which we gradually attain a more adequate perception of our state before god i say a more adequate because after all it is but a small part of the great and complex multitude of the sins of our life which we ever see in this world they were all present one by one in their distinctness and in their guilt before the divine vision of jesus in the garden of his agony they all are written in the book of his remembrance they will all be revived before our eyes in the particular judgment but now our fullest perception of them is inadequate and falls short of these true and divine revelations of what we are still as they come out more and more into the light so they become each one a subject of sorrow though our lord does not require of us a separate act of sorrow for each separate sin yet each separate sin as it comes to mind will be a new motive to sorrow and though the act of sorrow be but one the motives will be many but all this may be no more than the sorrow of holy fear awakened by the deadliness and the baseness of our sins as they stand out before the conscience illuminated by the spirit of god number two there is then another kind of sorrow more pure and generous which springs from a sense of the love of god he loved us while we were yet in sin the prodigal in the far country remembered his father and his father's love the consciousness that his father loved him still moved him to return and to accuse himself with a profound humility the sense of his unworthiness and of his ingratitude was sharpened by the sense of his father's tenderness the sunshine of his childhood and of his boyhood and the light of his father's countenance rose full upon him once more and he knew that although he was all changed his father was still the same that though his heart was hardened his father's heart was yet full of loving kindness all this he felt 
while he was still far off in his misery how much more when his father fell upon his neck gave him the kiss of peace and arrayed him once more in the raiment and the ring of sonship then the consciousness of his own selfishness and ingratitude deepened all his contrition it was keen while he was yet trembling in his sins but keener far when his sins had been forgiven the absolution of his father's love elevated him to a higher and to a more generous because a more loving sorrow so it is in the sacrament of penance when we have indeed tasted that the lord is sweet and have been made the subjects of his miraculous love when we have received from him the pledge that when as yet we were sinners christ died for us and while we were yet in our sins our heavenly father loved us with an everlasting love then we begin to understand the words of the holy ghost god so loved the world as to give his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him may not perish but have life everlasting in this is charity not as though we had loved god but because he hath first loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins then we see that but for this changeless love we should long since have died eternally that by it he bore with us in childhood in the times of our ignorance in youth in the time of our sin and in manhood in the time of our cool and deliberate self-love it is the mercies of the lord that we are not consumed because his tender mercies have not failed we wake up to know that we have been encompassed and enveloped in the love of god that we have been borne up and sustained by it even when we thought nothing of him nay even when we were provoking him every day as if the prodigal after his return had begun to carry himself loftily and to forget his past unworthiness and even to relapse and after his relapse to be once more forgiven for such is our state again and again we have sinned like the prodigal and again and again our heavenly father has received us as he did at the first time with the kiss of peace and the perfect absolution it was this thought that made saint catherine of genoa so profoundly contrite in the progress of her repentance a ray of god's love so intensely burning and piercing was infused into her soul that all appeared to her in a new light her past and her present life her sins of thought word and deed her sins of commission and omission all bore a new meaning and received a new interpretation number three again there is another motive of sorrow that is the special sense of our personal sinfulness i have already spoken of the sorrow arising from the knowledge of our sins but this sorrow for our personal sinfulness is different in kind many who are covered with a multitude of sins have little of it some have most of it whose sins are lightest and fewest for it is a perception depending upon what we are and the most saintly hearts are the most illuminated i have already quoted st clare st vincent ferrer and st francis borgia as proofs i might take one more example and that from st paul who says that christ jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom i am the chief and this he said not by way of a pious exaggeration but because of the knowledge he had of himself it is no rash and rhetorical overstatement but the true expression of his inward consciousness as the following reasons will show first of all we do not know so much formal evil of any one as we know of ourselves we may indeed know more material evil of many that is 
we may know of many who have fallen into sins more glaring and scandalous from which we have been preserved but the formal evil of actions is to be estimated by the internal acts and these by the light we possess and by the operations of the holy spirit against whom we have sinned it is certain therefore that lesser sins against greater light are more formally sinful than greater sins against lesser light and it is this we may know of ourselves but we cannot know of any other our lord one day said to saint mactildus come and see the least in the kingdom of heaven and thou shalt know the fountain of loving-kindness and she saw a man clothed in a green garment with smooth hair of middle stature and very beautiful countenance she asked who art thou and he said i was upon earth a robber and a malefactor and never did i anything good she asked how didst thou enter into this joy he answered all the evils i did were done not out of wickedness but as by custom and because i knew no better because i was reared up in them by my parents wherefore by penance i found mercy with god again we do not know of any one who has received so great graces as we have others may have received more but we do not know it we are able to measure in some degree but that most imperfectly the numberless gifts which god has bestowed upon each one of us that is in our baptism confirmation communions and penance in our childhood youth and manhood the lights inspirations stings of conscience and impulses of heart which have perpetually moved and sustained us all this inner world of our own god knows and so does each one for himself but of another no man can judge even the nearest do not know how much grace god has bestowed upon others how much less can we know and judge those who are afar off we are conscious not only of the abundance of sacramental graces but of the graces out of the sacraments which have filled the atmosphere in which we breathe and pervade every moment of our lives so far as we know none have ever received so many none have ever been so followed and sustained so invited and solicited so warned and so encouraged all the wonderful long-suffering and patience the delicacy and generosity of the holy spirit with us from our baptism we know it is like the continuous beat of our heart which we have felt from our earliest childhood we are personally conscious of our own spiritual life but we can only know that of another by hearsay and a most imperfect and fragmentary observation and as we know of no one who has received so many graces as we have so we know of no one who has so little corresponded with them out of many lights we have followed few and out of many invitations we have accepted only a scanty number many graces we have altogether lost by resistance and many with which we ought to have corresponded generously and adequately we have hardly answered at all or with an ungenerous reserve what might we not have been now if we had been true to our baptismal grace how soon it was soiled how wantonly it was squandered how tardily and reluctantly we answered to the grace of conversion which led us back to penance how little time we retained our first absolution or the fervour of our first communion or the strength of our confirmation or the spirit of holy fear which came upon us in our chastisements or the spirit of praise which sprung up within us in the days of consolation all our whole life 
has been a long series of graces given profusely and little used of divine generosity and human illiberality of inexhaustible mercy on god's part and niggardly returns on ours it is not only then the sight of our sins of which i spoke first but the sight of ourselves and of our sins as committed in the midst of such graces and by one who has been singled out for such endless and countless mercies that ought to deepen our sorrow with a new motive and to soften us with a peculiar sense of our own personal sinfulness number four but there is still another kind of sorrow less personal and more generous than the last and that is the sorrow which springs from the passion of jesus they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him with the marvellous precision of thought which marks the theology of the church a distinction is made between the imperfect and the perfect contrition that is between attrition and contrition properly so called the word attrition signifies the bruising of the heart as by a fall or by a blow but contrition signifies the bruising to powder the perfect breaking up of the hardness of the heart the former expresses well the action of grace but the latter the action which love alone can accomplish and such is the distinction i have tried to mark between a sorrow for sins and a sorrow for our personal sinfulness there is however another word in common use still more expressive and with a distinction more clearly and finely marked and that is compunction this signifies a piercing and a piercing together with our lord jesus christ a partaking in his wounds as compassion is partaking in his sufferings as contrition then is the perfection of attrition compunction is the perfection of contrition it is its mature and ultimate form and stands to the previous kinds of sorrow as the beatitudes to the gifts and graces of the holy ghost after the sorrow and shame which spring from contemplating the guilt and baseness and deadliness of sin comes the sorrow which springs from god's love and our own ingratitude and then from the sufferings of the sacred heart in gethsemane and on calvary and from our personal guilt towards him who loved us so much and has been loved by us so little the motives of this sorrow are specially the bloody sweat the five sacred wounds the wounds of the sacred countenance and the divine sorrow of the sacred heart all the day long have i spread forth my hands to a people that believeth not and contradicteth me and in his outstretched palms the print of the nails reproaches us with the sharpness of death which he overcame for us and for the hardness of heart with which we have crucified him again and again unto ourselves he is always before our eyes set forth crucified among us and crying to us from the cross o all ye that pass by the way attend and see if there be any sorrow like to my sorrow for he hath made a vintage of me as the lord spoke in the day of his fierce anger truly we pass by and leave him to hang all alone upon the cross for us we pass by and pass on to our pleasure our forgetfulness our ease and the remembrance of his ineffable sorrow leaves no impression upon our lives and casts no shadow over our careless hearts we go all the day without remembering him we look upon the crucifix without accusing ourselves of having caused his great sorrow and of robbing his cross of its fruit in ourselves and of renewing his passion by returning to the sins 
for which he died now this sorrow once conceived is a sorrow which will grow as long as life lasts for the contemplation of the passion of jesus is inexhaustible and that every new manifestation of his love and of his sufferings casts a new light upon our sins and here we have the key to what we have already seen namely that the greatest saints have sorrowed most for sin they have sorrowed most because they have known most of his love and passion and because they were most like him in his hatred for sin and his zeal for the glory of his father such then was the illuminated compunction of st paul when he called himself the chief of sinners it is the perfection of such sorrow to be self-forgetting as it is purified of self it remembers only jesus st mary magdalene when she hurried to the pharisee's house and stood behind our divine redeemer weeping was full of sorrow and of love and yet what was her contrition then compared with her sorrow when she stood by the cross of jesus on calvary or when she lingered all alone and weeping at the empty sepulchre and knew not where they had laid him what made this change in her sorrow but the passion of jesus the true and divine crucifix on which she had gazed on calvary we read in the writings of blessed angela of foligno that she passed through eighteen degrees of compunction beginning with a confession in which through natural shame she concealed her sins and ending in the sorrow of the saints after she had made many steps in the way of contrition she tells us that one day at the sight of the crucifix a flood of sorrow and self-accusation came upon her with a sense of her ingratitude to him whom her sins had pierced so that she was overwhelmed with a grief beyond control and ever afterwards the sight of a crucifix was enough to throw her into a tumult of sorrow insomuch that her companions were forced to hide it from her such is the contrition of a soul pierced with the consciousness of the wounds of jesus and wounded itself by them it says with saint paul with christ i am nailed to the cross and with him its sorrows and for his sake number five lastly there is a sorrow which crowns all and is the special gift of the holy ghost a sorrow which st paul calls the sorrow that is according to god working penance steadfast unto salvation our lord promised this sorrow when he said when he that is the holy ghost is come he will convince the world of sin we have seen how a penitent who brings nothing but the sorrow of faith and hope to the sacrament of penance receives therein the sanctifying grace of the holy ghost and charity and by the infusion of charity is raised once more to the life of god and elevated to union with him thenceforth he is able to make acts of perfect contrition though perhaps at the time of his absolution he may not do so yet he is thereby placed in a state of habitual power so to do and all the motives of contrition of which i have spoken begin to work upon his heart and his whole disposition of soul towards god becomes more filial loving and generous and the vision of god and of himself grows more clear and abiding and his sense of the love and of the passion of jesus more vivid and subduing so that day by day his sorrow is purified of servile fear and of selfish desires in the measure in which the sanctification of the soul is deepened and enlarged the sorrow for sin is increased 
that which hinders sorrow for sin is sin itself the more sin is cast out the more sorrow enters therefore as we have seen the greatest saints have always had the greatest sorrow for their sins and also for the sins of others they have lamented all their life long with a vehemence of self-accusation for acts which others perhaps would have hardly confessed at all saint teresa speaks of herself in a language which would make us suppose her guilty of great and grave sins when from her confessors we know that she never committed a mortal sin the cause of this is the supernatural light in which she estimated sin as in the light of god himself the consciousness that in sinning we have grieved and resisted the holy ghost our sanctifier our patient guide and our helper who from our baptism has never left us for a moment unless we have forsaken him and at the first relenting of our hearts has returned to us to inhabit our whole soul in all its power of action and affection is the last perfection of a contrite heart we have seen how the sorrows of st mary magdalene increased in purity and intensity as she drew nearer to the passion and cross of jesus but there were others with her on calvary whose sorrow for sin was deeper and more profound than hers the beloved disciple knew even more profoundly the deadliness of sin and the divine hatred against it in the heart of the immaculate mother of god seven dollars like the currents of seven seas met together she who was without sin knew best of all creatures the baseness and deadliness of sin the love of god the personal sinfulness of men the passion of her divine son for sinners and because she had no sin therefore her sorrow was according to god profound supernatural and intense to the full measure of which a creature is capable there was then never any sorrow greater than hers except one the sorrow of jesus himself his sorrow in gethsemane is the type of perfect contrition it was a sorrow for sin and for the love of god free pure and generous velut mare contritio tua his contrition was as the sea profound overwhelming and immense and in proportion as we are conformed to his sacred heart our contrition will be like his great sorrow the thought of god of his glory of his love rises over everything else as saint catherine of genoa says of purgatory it is not so much the remembrance of sin as the love of god which causes the pain of the holy souls for their sorrow ascending to god is like his own sorrow it is like the divine displeasure with which the holy ghost looks upon our sins when as saint paul says we grieve him it is the grief of god himself the sorrow of jesus is the sorrow also of a human heart but the grief of the holy ghost is altogether and alone divine such is the universal and efficacious the supernatural and tranquil sorrow which the church calls perfect contrition raised from motive to motive and matured by the presence and operations of the holy ghost in the soul and now although such a sorrow is the gift of god yet it is to be sought and to be obtained in and through the sacrament of penance i have already shown to whom it is necessary and to whom it is beneficial some confessions therefore are of obligation and some of devotion we may leave aside the confessions of necessity and of obligation for i am now chiefly speaking of confessions of devotion i desire to show that frequent confession is a great and manifold benefit 
even to those to whom it is not necessary i have shown how it exacts and sustains the habit of a stated reckoning with ourselves how it renews our absolution and our peace with god how it infuses a new sacramental grace every time we receive it and how it continually elevates and perfects our attrition changing it into contrition and our contrition illuminating it and changing it into compunction and all these benefits are obtained by those who come worthily to the sacrament of penance week by week even though they bring only venial sins or even nothing but a renewed accusation and contrition for mortal sins long ago confessed and forgiven and in order that frequent confession may be neither a mere habit nor a too familiar act we shall do well to keep alive the habit of making acts of contrition not only day by day but often every day it is a good and useful practice to make a list of the sins by which we have displeased god or to which we are most tempted and to repeat them name by name every morning together with a list of the graces most opposed to them and to ask them of the holy spirit with acts of sorrow for the many times we have grieved him by the faults of which we have been guilty in this way we may renew our sorrow for the mortal sins already confessed and absolved for the venial sins not yet confessed and for the entanglement and confusion of thoughts words deeds and omissions which make up our daily life if we need an act of contrition we can find none better than the name of jesus as jesus i am sorry for the baseness and the multitude of my sins jesus i am sorry because of the goodness of thy father and my father whom i have offended make thou my sorrow to be deeper more loving and more fervent until the hour of my death end of chapter three chapter four of the love of jesus to penitence by henry edward manning this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the sacrament of penance the sacrament of reparation we have seen the shame and sorrow of saint mary magdalene in the house of simon the pharisee in the beginning of her conversion and then the courage and fidelity of her devotion at the foot of the cross and now when all was over when she had watched the sufferings of jesus to the last and had helped to lay him in his tomb when all her service of love was done her heart was still busy about his memory she went and brought spices and ointments and rested on the sabbath day intending to anoint him on the morrow beautiful and wonderful fidelity of tender and grateful love jesus was dead what could now avail these ministries of devotion to his memory yet they were due and sweet she owed them to him to whom she owed all and though he should know nothing of them they were sweet to her for his sake in this we see the character of generous contrition from the hour that she washed our saviour's feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head she laid aside for ever the vanity and luxury with which she had offended his divine sanctity thenceforward all her life was a perpetual mortification of her natural self st peter after he had whipped bitterly for his three denials entered upon a life of reparation to his divine master which had its proportionate end and crown in his inverted cross on mount geniculum st paul says that in him first christ jesus had shown forth all patience 
forasmuch as he had been a persecutor and contumelious therefore he spent a long life in reparation which he describes as always bearing about in our body the mortification of jesus his long life of supernatural toil and suffering was crowned at last by the lictor's sword at the salvian waters with the diadem of martyrdom such was the spirit of reparation among the disciples of jesus free spontaneous and unsparing even unto death in this we have a beautiful example of the spirit of satisfaction which is infused and perfected in the sacrament of penance now the church teaches us that the only condition to absolution is contrition including confession either in fact or in desire so that satisfaction or the penance which follows after perfects but is not of the essence of contrition though it be imposed nevertheless it is willingly accepted and therefore is a free and spontaneous return for a free and spontaneous pardon and the effect of it is to expiate and to make reparation to expiate the pains due to us for the sins which have been absolved by a voluntary chastisement of self and to make reparation to the sacred heart of jesus which we have wounded by our ingratitudes such is the penance imposed on us in our absolution but it also sets before us what ought to be the lifelong fruit of this sacrament it teaches that all the life of those who have been absolved ought to be spent in satisfaction for the past first i will try to explain what this spirit of reparation consists of and then will show how it is infused and perfected in the sacrament of penance number one it consists then first in an indignation against ourselves st paul writing to the corinthians expresses this as follows that you were made sorrowful according to god how great carefulness it worketh in you yea defence yea indignation yea fear yea desire yea zeal yea revenge they indeed felt this indignation for the shame brought on them by the sins of another how much more reason for keener indignation have we for the sins which we have each one committed against god for the sins of deliberation whereby we have grieved and resisted his holy spirit contradicted his will broken his law and outraged his love god made us for himself for his love and for his glory he made us capable of knowing and loving worshipping and serving of praising and glorifying him but we have robbed and defrauded him we have borne bitter fruits or have stood barren before him is it possible to fail of the end of our creation more than we have failed moreover we have need to be indignant with ourselves for our habitual inclination to self for the love and worship of our own will for our waste of life and time and the natural powers which god has given us for the neglect of our visitations and opportunities of graces and of sacraments if we examine one of our sins of commission or of omission in the light of god's presence and by the light of the incarnation and passion of jesus or in the light of the holy ghost we shall find abundant matter for indignation against ourselves if for nothing else for our instability in good we seem to have so little affinity to it and so little union with it that we vary and waver between good and evil as if they were alike to us and indifferent in themselves now any one who has attained such a knowledge of himself as i endeavoured to explain in the last two chapters must feel spring up in him shame and zeal 
and indignation against himself with a desire to humble and punish himself and to take as st paul says a revenge number two next to this comes a sense of gratitude blessed alvarez used to say that his faults were like so many windows which set in the light of the love of god upon his soul for each one of them became a fresh evidence of the patience and tenderness of god towards him how much more the sins of which we have been guilty and the faults which we carry to confession each week the love and compassion of god which like a great stream is continually descending upon us every day would awaken gratitude in a stone he raised us from spiritual death in baptism and has raised us again and again in penance sometimes as saint augustine says like jairus's daughter just dead sometimes like the widow's son already carried out to burial sometimes like lazarus four days buried in the grave he has received us back again like the prodigal not once only but many times he has reinvested us with our lost inheritance and perhaps called us to a higher path in his kingdom and given us special illuminations and special union with himself if these things do not elicit gratitude we must be dead indeed now the sacrament of penance is the special manifestation of these gifts and graces and therefore the special means of awaking us to a sense of them number three a third element in the spirit of reparation is generosity and this is luminously manifested to us in the sovereign grace of absolution in it god gives us pardon with a fullness a freeness a facility and inexhaustible frequency which exceeds all we can ask or think even the most soiled and unworthy he restores to his peace and love our heavenly father keeps back nothing from us all that is communicable he gives to us jesus gives us all that he can part with the holy ghost gives himself and all things again and again seventy times seven as often as we turn and repent now this ought at least to awake in us some generosity in return at least we ought to be as generous in forgiving others as he is in forgiving us if god gives himself to us surely we cannot be slow to give of our substance in alms if he should call us to forsake all and to follow his steps we could not refuse to rise up and to go after him if he should draw us to give ourselves to him as he has given himself for us how could we hang back number four another disposition included in the spirit of reparation is a hatred not only of the least actual sin but also of lukewarmness our absolution shows us how great a price was paid for us how much it cost him to institute this sacrament of his free compassion on our behalf it is the fruit of his agony in the garden and of his passion upon the cross nothing could have obtained it for us but his most precious blood this sets sin before us as an insult to his cross as a wound in the sacred heart as a betrayal of jesus sometimes for a piece of money or for a pleasure with fair possessions of fidelity that is we also betray him by a kiss if he loved us so as to consume himself for us in the fire of his charity how without great personal sin can we be lukewarm towards him cold returns for warm friendship are intolerable among men 
neglect will separate those who have never otherwise offended each other so between us and jesus he is all love for us and we have treated him as if he had done nothing for our good and suffered nothing in our stead it is very slowly that we come to perceive this fault in our hearts but when once perceived we know and we feel that we can never do enough for him all that we do seems feeble and cold number five lastly the spirit of reparation contains in it a love of the cross jesus loved it for our sakes if we love him we must love it for his sake we laid it upon him by our sins at least we ought to be willing to lay it upon ourselves in reparation st paul says they that are christ's have crucified their flesh with the vices and concupiscences first in penance and the mortification of the sin that dwells in us in the life of reparation which springs from a generous love of our divine master for this cause the crosses which come upon us from the hand of god ought to be borne with submission and with sweetness and the crosses which come from the hand of men ought likewise to be received with patience and even with gladness they do but conform us to jesus in the two great perfections of his humility to be like him is necessary to salvation and it is also sweet to those who love him nay if we be generous we shall choose to be like him in his humiliation and in his cross rather than to be prosperous and in honour it is a hard lesson but a true one even if we knew that we might be saved with equal certainty in a life of fair days and bright lights and smooth even ways a generous love to our divine lord would make us choose the shadow of his life and the sharpness of his path because it unites us more closely to him if only by imitation and by the evidence of our love and gratitude if a brother or a friend were in the field of battle it would be still lawful for us to enjoy the pleasant things of home as when they were with us but an instinct of generous affection would make us turn from pleasures and find consolation even in privations as a way of sharing in hardship with those we love and manifesting our love to them if this be true of kinsmen and friends in the imperfect state of our humanity how much more of him who is not only our friend and brother but also our saviour and our redeemer our lord and our god and this which ought to bind us if it were only by love and gratitude has another motive more personal to us a life of generous penance is to all even to the most mature the safer path st vincent de paul used to say if we had one foot in heaven yet if we cease to mortify ourselves before we could draw the other after it we should be in danger of losing our soul st paul says all things are lawful to me but all things are not expedient there are many things which i might lawfully do which would not help me to overcome my faults or avoid temptations or sanctify my heart or save my soul i am free to enjoy much that is fair and bright and sweet and in itself harmless but it would not add a grace to my soul nor a spark of the love of god nor a fibre of strength to my will it would not build me up in the life of god now observe st paul does not here try those things by the harm they would do him nor by the danger he might incur they would do him no good they would add nothing to his state before god and they might become occasions of some entanglement and temptation 
therefore he adds all things are lawful to me but i will not be brought under the power of any that is i will keep my liberty by not using it i will not so use it as to give to anything a power over my peace and tranquillity of heart or over the freedom of my soul from all things but jesus to whom alone i am in bondage in the sweet service of the spirit of life there is need of few words to show how the sacrament of penance infuses and perfects this spirit of generous love for it requires of us a firm resolution of the will against all sin and it imposes on us a penance in satisfaction for our sins now this penance might be long and rigorous extended over our whole life but though it were ever so extended even until death it would not make adequate satisfaction for the sins we have committed how much less adequate reparation to the love of jesus which we have outraged by commission and omission by wounds and by coldness the practice of the church in these latter times has been to impose penances which are both light and consoling such as devotion to the ever-blessed trinity the sacred heart of jesus the holy ghost to our blessed mother a few prayers to be said once over often this is all and the world mocks at it as a superstition and a nullity and the pharisaic religion of these latter days treats it as lax and antinomian but wisdom is justified by all her children it is especially the sacrament of penance with these light and benign penances which awakens the spirit of generous love and this will do all the rest it shows us first the price he paid for us how he suffered for us a passion equal to and far beyond the guilt of all our sins and of the sins of the whole world we see too how great was the guilt of our sins nothing but the most precious blood of the incarnate son could cancel how great must be the ingratitude and the hatefulness of our sin which pierced the son of god with his unknown and unspeakable sorrows every absolution bears this witness to us next it shows us how little he exacts from us he requires indeed that we should come to him that we should leave off sinning accuse ourselves at his feet and promise to sin no more less than this he could not ask and no more than this he requires of the greatest sinner he thereby puts us upon the law of liberty of which st james writes so speak ye and so do as being to be judged by the law of liberty he puts us upon probation of our gratitude generosity and love he pardons us at once even before we fulfil our penance our absolution does not depend upon its fulfilment and the little penance we perform he not only accepts but elevates to a higher order and invests with a great efficiency in this way he appeals to our generosity his own generosity upbraids us if he be so generous to us what ought we to be to him and finally it inspires by the grace of the holy spirit a desire to offer ourselves to him in reparation what is past we cannot undo what remains then but for the future to love him with generosity and to give to him not the fruit only but the tree with the fruit that is ourselves our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice pleasing unto god and for this we have many motives first because of our sins next for the sin of those whom we have tempted gain for the sins of all more especially christians and catholics and finally for the passion of jesus christ 
lastly the spirit of reparation has a great reward not only in the life to come but also in this none are so peaceful so free so happy as the generous the narrow-hearted are always scrupulous and in bondage to themselves they have as st thomas of villanova says intellectum in celo voluntatem in cheno they are drawn up by high visions and by the intellectual perception of the blessedness of a devoted and holy life but they are also drawn down by the soft alluring and foolish attachments of taste custom fancy and the fear of the world and between these two they waver and are distracted and suffer a perpetual strain like men upon the rack none are more restless and depressed than people who take their full liberty in all things which are not sin they are always wishing for the higher and falling into the lower path they begin with courage to choose the better and the nobler part and they end in a cowardice which makes them shrink from the least denial of their own will or limitation of their own liberty they shrink with fear from an austere life and yet know that lax lives are always uneasy and unsafe happy are they who can make up their mind the decided are always calm even in the midst of trouble they know their path and their way is clear before them they who generously choose the higher and austerer life enter into a great peace it is sweet because it is chosen for jesus sake at first they shrink perhaps from natural infirmity and the will fears what the light of faith dictates and what its own choice decides but the holy ghost is a generous spirit and never calls a soul to higher paths without elevating the will freely and generously to choose them the cross becomes sweet when it is chosen and light when it is lifted on the shoulder if the life of the generous be happy their death is blessed the time of their weakness is the time of his power when they sink under the burden of mortality then is the hour of his special generosity and of their ineffable consolation and yet not only in life and death but most of all the reward of the generous is laid up for them in purgatory the spirit of reparation gives to their penance a wonderful power of expiation a few years of loving sorrow with gratitude and self-chastisement will expiate we know not what debt of pain the more penance here the less purgatory hereafter immediately after death st peter of alcantara was seen ascending with great glory into heaven and out of the midst of his joy he said see how great a glory a few years of penance bring nor is generosity reserved for saints mary magdalene is the type of generous sorrow a heroic act not only of martyrdom but of reparation is enough to absolve all guilt and to expiate all pain in the life of st vincent ferrer we read of a great and habitual sinner who at last made his confession to him it was a terrible life of long and complicated wickedness when the penitent expected long years of mortification and heavy penances st vincent bade him fast every friday for a year the penitent begged him not to trifle with a case so desperate as his believing that the saint was speaking in irony st vincent commuted the penance to the seven penitential psalms once more the penitent begged him not to treat him with levity the saint then bade him say once a pater ave and gloria and that night the penitent sinner died and the saint saw him in vision ascending to the heavenly glory the love of god had broken up the fountains of love and sorrow in his heart and his nature gave way under the compassion of jesus 
the agony of his self-accusation and the will to expiate had made a perfect reparation for the sins of a life and lastly those little privations of a generous love will receive from his hands a great reward there is no humility and less generosity in saying if only i can be saved i shall be content our salvation is not the final end of our being but his glory and if we aim at being saved at the least glory to our redeemer we may easily lose our souls for what is the greater crown it is not the visible splendor of the heavenly court but the internal and essential glory of the saints it is to be nearer to him to know him more fully to be more like to him and to love him with a more ardent and eternal love and this is measured by our state in this life for glory is but grace made perfect the fruit of the blossom which now is this is the thought which out of the feeble and fearful has made martyrs confessors penitents missionaries priests and nuns the highest aspirations are often united with the weakest natures our natural infirmity shrinks when our will is inflexible jesus in his agony is the example of what they have to endure who make satisfaction for sin to god and he shows us that our suffering does not take away from the perfection of our submission or our sacrifice they whom jesus calls to martyrdom suffer and exult their lower nature is wounded with ineffable pain but their higher is in the foretaste of the beatific vision all who have confessed jesus before men have had to suffer shame and sorrow but they chose it with gladness for his sake penitents have abandoned all that was dearest to them with joy not to be told for the sweetness of making reparation to him sons have left their home and all its charities dear as life to expiate as missionaries among the heathen the sins of a life not soiled by a mortal sin youths have with gladness forsaken the world for all its hopes to take the solitary yoke of jesus in the sacerdotal life daughters to whom all affections ministered have turned from all to serve him in a cloister or in a rude and exposed life among the souls for which he died and yet all these have had moments of irresolution and fear of shrinking and relapse in which nothing saved them from falling from their higher aspirations and losing the vocation of god but the one deep still but constraining thought sweet and persuasive that to choose the lot which jesus chose on earth would be more pleasing to the sacred heart of their master and their lord this one thought of generous love to him who has done all for us for whom we can do nothing who nevertheless accepts the nothing we do and by working in us both to will and to accomplish gives it a power of reparation this alone has made the earth to blossom like the rose and the lily and has illuminated the church with the lights of sanctity and brought the multitude whom no man can number to the throne of jesus and to his eternal joy end of chapter four chapter five of the love of jesus to penitents by henry edward manning this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five the sacrament of penance the sacrament of perseverance our divine lord has said he that shall persevere unto the end he shall be saved 
which is also to say and no other shall twice he declared this truth in words which thrill and awe us to read them no man putting his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of god and again remember lot's wife god has revealed to us the history of his elect running down from the creation through the ages of grace but all along the line and beside it as a parallel runs the history of those that have fallen every state and order of his servants has the witness of instability in itself of the holy angels created in the nearest likeness of their maker and placed upon the steps of the throne of god multitudes fell into eternal death of his elect people the apostle writes i would not have you ignorant brethren that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all in moses were baptized in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink and they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was christ but with the most of them god was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the desert prophets also have fallen balaam in the midst of the divine visitations perished among the enemies of god seers likewise fell as solomon wisest of men and apostles as judas and christians in the first grace of their regeneration as ananias and sapphira the annals of the church are full of such warnings the line of heresiarchs is a long history of the forfeiture of grace and in the lives of the saints the same examples of perseverance and of falling are found side by side in the franciscan chronicles to give one instance for many we read of a brother justin who renounced the world high honors and great employments to become a religious his progress in the life of perfection was so great that he was visited with raptures in prayer and many supernatural favors his brethren counted him a saint he went to rome in the time of eugenius the fourth who received him with great veneration would not let him kiss his feet but embraced him made him sit at his side and bestowed many privileges upon him all this awakened pride and turned his head when he went back to his convent st john capistrano said to him you went an angel you are come back a devil soon after this he fell into great private sins and open breaches of the public law he died in prison these examples teach one truth all depends on perseverance without this nothing avails the grace and perfection and splendor of the angels could not save them the election of israel the miracles in egypt the manna in the wilderness were all in vain the converse with god the resistance of an angel availed nothing for balaam the illumination which laid open the natural and supernatural worlds to solomon did not profit him the daily fellowship with jesus his doctrines and miracles and three years of his presence did not save judas the gift of regeneration and of the sacraments of grace were all in vain to ananias and sapphira all alike lacked one thing and that one thing lacking lost them all things they had not perseverance and though they had everything else nothing without this was of any avail it remains therefore to show what perseverance is and how the sacrament of penance infuses and sustains it first as to the nature of perseverance theologians distinguish it into the active and the passive perseverance the active is a virtue on our part the passive a gift on the part of god 
the active perseverance consists first in our fidelity to the grace god has bestowed upon us that is in corresponding with the light of faith in the intellect with the impulses of charity in the heart and the inspirations of the holy ghost in the will in surrendering ourselves with a filial and watchful promptness to the operations and calls of god in the soul secondly it consists in fervor which is not so much any ardent affection or vehement emotion of the heart as a constant devotion of the will fervor is made up of three things first regularity in all duties in the order and habit of the interior life secondly in punctuality in doing all things in season at the right time or in the right way and lastly exactness in doing all things as perfectly as we can remembering for whom we do them and that the greatest actions if done ill and without this motive are as nothing and that the least actions are great if done perfectly and for god and thirdly perseverance springs from delicacy of conscience which consists in the vividness and sensitiveness of the heart and in the promptness and activity of the will under the operations of grace the fathers say res delicata spiritus sanctus because his purity love and patience are grieved even with things of which our dullness makes little account so i may say a pure conscience has delicate sense derived from the holy spirit himself and in harmony with all his operations so that as soon as he moves the conscience answers as kindred notes vibrate or as the leaves incline before the motion of the air and the sea undulates under the presence of the lightest wind this is the essence of perseverance on our part and from this internal state comes the acts of obedience penance mortification expiation reparation constancy fortitude self-sacrifice and endurance to the end which constitutes what we call final perseverance but it is certain that without the passive perseverance which is a gift on god's part no one will so persevere to the end the holy council of trent teaches that no man without a special privilege of grace will avoid all sin not that it is physically impossible but only morally certain it is physically possible that of a thousand arrows shot at a mark every one may strike but it is morally certain that many will fall short pass beyond or swerve aside there is abstractedly no intrinsic impossibility in this but it is certain that the wandering of the eye or the unsteadiness of the hand or the motions of the air or the wavering of the will or some other cause will hinder the flight and the aim of many in a thousand shafts so it is in our cooperation with grace lights visitations inspirations come down upon us like showers but it is only a few among many with which we correspond or if we correspond it is in an inadequate proportion we receive grace as a hundred and we correspond as twenty or we receive as twenty and correspond as one the waste of nature which is always sowing the world broadcast on sea and land on mountain and rock with seeds every one of which has life and fruitfulness in it is a true analogy to the waste of grace which inundates us and passes unheeded away if then there were not another special grace of perseverance by which god in his free sovereign mercy sustains us no soul should be saved and yet that grace cannot be merited by us god has not promised to bestow it on anything we do there is no proportion or link established by his promise 
between our perseverance and this surpassing gift it is to the end his free and sovereign grace the first grace and the last the alpha and the omega of our salvation are in his hand alone no man can merit regeneration which is the first grace in our salvation nor the last without which regeneration is all in vain god holds the first link and the last of our golden chain of grace in his own hand and bestows it on whom he will we may pray for it but we cannot merit it we may dispose ourselves to receive it but we can never claim it at his hand it is bestowed upon us out of pure love and grace through the prayers and merits of his saints out of the sacred heart of jesus who has purchased it for us in his most precious blood it is easy then to see how both the virtue and the gift of perseverance is to be lost one mortal sin destroys it utterly the prophet ezekiel warns even the just of their danger of falling if the just man turn himself away from his justice and do iniquity shall he live all his justices which he hath done shall not be remembered in the prevarication by which he hath prevaricated and in his sin which he hath committed in them he shall die all that he has seen or has done or has suffered in one moment is lost and for such a fall we generally prepare ourselves by a multitude of lesser faults satan seldom tempts the just to a mortal sin all at once the shock of the temptation itself would arouse them to watchfulness he that contemneth small things shall fall little by little ecclesiasticus chapter nineteen verse one it is by little ruining temptations which wear and fret away the integrity and firmness of the will that he begins his assault he leads men into the occasions of lesser faults and so by degrees deadens the hatred and the very fear of sin and inspires a boldness to venture where before they would not have dared to go then come strong attractions fascinations and entanglements and last of all the tempter's hour is come and for such a fall he prepares by inspiring a presumption of our own strength contentionem precedit superbia pride goeth before destruction proverbs chapter sixteen verse eighteen we confide in our own lights even those which are internal and supernatural and in our own supernatural attainments as if they were our own this is what is called the storm in the harbour the whirlwind which comes down upon the soul when it has escaped out of the sea into the calm water of the haven the perdition which falls upon the soul after it has found peace with god and is anchored to the eternal shore that which chiefly brings on this great and subtle danger is a secret neglect of prayer a weariness and aversion from speaking with god and this again begins in a loss of fervour and punctuality in devotion and this loss arises from some secret infidelity of the heart which brings films over it and shadows of fear so that the light and warmth of the divine presence is at first slightly veiled as by a mist and then is hid so that we lose the consciousness of it and the holy fear which it inspires and keeps alive the true cause of those preparatory and secret falls is some interior sin of the heart known only to god and to ourselves the world has dim eyes and can only see external sins and even of these only such as blot the life outwardly but the external act does not constitute the sin the sin is perfect already in the internal act of the heart by the knowledge of the understanding 
and the consent of the will this is the essential malice of sin to which the external act adds only an accidental increase and the sin of scandal in this way men prepare themselves long before it may be for years they stand to all appearance in flower and fruit but like trees which have a decay at the heart they go at last in a sudden wind and all men wonder at their fall till it lays open their heart and then men wonder that they stood so long and did not come down long ago and this shows further how our perseverance is to be sustained first and above all by a habitual consciousness of the love of god through the sacred heart of jesus working upon our hearts humbling softening and kindling them with love in return this consciousness that we are objects of the love of god this sense of a personal relation and personal friendship with the sacred heart of jesus is to the soul what the sun with its ardor and splendor is to the seeds and to the fruits of the earth it quickens vivifies unfolds ripens perfects everything to doubt of god's love brings winter into the soul to feel it feebly and faintly is as the cloudy and churlish sky which hinders the ripening influence of the light in darkness all things pale and die if only we can live in an habitual sense of our perfect pardon and absolution through the most precious blood of jesus of his friendship for us and our discipleship to him of his perpetual presence love and care we shall have the root of perseverance firmly fixed in our will and for this we need no great learning no mystical no dogmatical theology a childlike heart is enough among the martyrs of cochin china in these last years was a simple catechumen the heathen scorned him for his ignorance and mocked him for his inability to answer their objections against the nature of god and for his obstinacy in dying for a god about whom he could give no account he answered in a family of many children some are grown to mature intelligence some are growing to youth some are infants all love their father but all do not know him equally the elder can give an account of him of his character and of the reasons why they love him but the infants know neither his character nor his name all that they know is that he is their father and that he loves them and this is their reason for loving him in return and trusting him with all their heart such is the true childlike love of god the basis and the crown of our perseverance the next support of our perseverance is a true knowledge of ourselves there are few more thrilling words in holy scripture than these there are just men and wise men and their works are in the hand of god and yet man knoweth not whether he be worthy of love or hatred ecclesiastes chapter nine verse one that is in the searching eyes of god we are so unlike what we are in the twilight of our own that whatsoever judgment we may have of ourselves god may all the while judge of us far otherwise this salutary fear of deceiving ourselves by too kind an opinion of our own state is the first condition of self-knowledge until we are willing to believe that we are probably far more sinful than we have ever known or suspected we shall make no great progress in self-knowledge we have to learn not only our sins but as we have seen our personal sinfulness our unworthiness our unprofitableness our littleness and our weakness and this will bring us another support by a growing contrition ripening into compunction and this cancels our venial sins 
reconciles the heart with god brings down great grace and unites the will with the will of jesus and from contrition springs the spirit of reparation a generous desire to make atonement to the sacred heart which has loved men so much and has been loved so little a spirit of reparation draws great graces from the sacred heart and engages all its generosity in our salvation these four things love self-knowledge contrition and reparation with a continual infusion of grace to repair the continual decays of every day are all we need to sustain this active perseverance on our part but these four graces are especially those which as i have shown the sacrament of penance infuses and perfects in us it is therefore the sacrament of perseverance and the means of preparing ourselves to receive of god the free grace of his sovereign mercy the gift of passive perseverance such is the outline of the subject i undertook to speak of and with a few words more i shall conclude i will then only add four simple rules to obtain this great gift of god number one first use the sacrament of penance fully and generously pour out your hearts like water they that so come oftenest to it are the most confirmed in perseverance and they who are most confirmed in perseverance are they who oftenest come to it according as we use it so it will be to us happy are they who come month by month happier they who come week by week they who come seldom to confession wonder what others can have to say who come so often but they who come seldom have always least to say because they have least self-knowledge they who come often as their self-knowledge increases find a greater facility and a greater desire to come oftener many of the saints as saint charles confessed every day we wonder what they could find to accuse themselves of it was because they were saints that they saw so much where we see so little if we had more of the supernatural light of the sacrament of penance we too should see as they did but to obtain this spiritual discernment habitual and frequent confession is necessary number two next be always beginning never think that you can relax or that you have attained the end st francis used to say continually to his brothers my brethren let us begin to love god a little he felt that he was only at the outset of the way of perfection a mere beginner in the science of god if we think ourselves to be more it is because we are less if we think ourselves more than beginners it is a sign that we have hardly yet begun there is no security for perseverance except in always advancing to stand still is impossible a boat ascending a running stream falls back as soon as it ceases to advance to hold its place is impossible unless it gain upon the stream so in the spiritual life the past is no guarantee for the future all the justice of the just man is gone in the day in which he falls and all his past obedience is no security against present transgression our lord therefore warns us to remember lot's wife she was saved by the visitation of angels drawn forth from destruction by the constraint of an angel's hand she was halfway to safety when she looked back and was cut off by the just judgment of god the past availed nothing only present fidelity from moment to moment is security for the future therefore again our divine lord said no man putteth his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of god that is 
the husbandman who turns in the furrow to look at his past work and lingers over his toil shall never reach the end of the field what we have done as yet is little compared to what remains to do we have to perfect our sanctification which even in saints is far off we have to expiate the pains due to a world of sins surpassing all memory and as yet we have but little chastised ourselves we have to complete the chain of graces by which we are bound to the eternal throne and many links are still wanting there is no time to lose let us hear how an apostle speaks of perseverance brethren i do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing i do forgetting the things that are behind and stretching forth myself to those that are before i press towards the mark to the prize of the supernal vocation of god in christ jesus philippians chapter three verses thirteen and fourteen know you not that they that run in a race all run indeed but one receiveth the prize so run that you may obtain and every one that striveth for the mastery refraineth himself from all things and they indeed that they may receive a corruptible crown but we an incorruptible one i therefore so run not as at an uncertainty i so fight not as one beating the air but i chastise my body and bring it into subjection lest perhaps when i have preached to others i myself should become a castaway first corinthians chapter nine verses twenty four and twenty seven if saint paul had need so to speak how much more such as we if all his supernatural grace his miraculous conversion and singular vocation his perils by land and by sea his labors and fasting visions and revelations if in these there was no security that he might not even become a reprobate how much more cause have we to live and die in holy fear this then is the second support of perseverance number three thirdly meditate every day upon the fall of those who begun well once perhaps they set out with as fair a hope of eternal life as we have their childhood and youth was it may be holier and nearer to god than ours a bright sunshine and a fair morning gave promise to a noontide of ripeness and an evening of peace perhaps they persevered as long or longer than we have yet and that against many dangers and temptations at last they fell their beginning was like ours and our end may be like theirs an awful and thrilling truth it is good to have it always before our eyes for instance the fall of the angels may teach us that no gift or perfection of grace will avail us if we lack stability they were created in excellence of knowledge and strength both natural and supernatural but they sinned and what was their sin but pride of which we have been guilty a thousand times they desired to be as god not that they aspired to his immensity or infinity or eternity for the angelic intelligence is too perfect and too luminous for such a folly but they desired to be independent of god they contemplated their own proper excellence till they became enamoured by self-love they sought to be happy in themselves by their own proper and natural beatitude to suffice to themselves and to be blissful without god this was their sin and what is it but the pride which is the sin of the world as st john calls it the pride of life we may also meditate on the fall of judas whose example is nearer to us than we are wont to imagine the greatness of his sin deceives many 
we believe ourselves to be in no danger of such a guilt and we forget that the sin of judas had once a beginning as fair as the sin we may be committing at this hour and in the end we may fall from god as deliberately as he did it is a very awful and touching thought that judas was once an innocent child like as we were that he was the object of a mother's love as tender as ever we have known that perhaps in boyhood he may have lived in the holy fear of the god of israel more watchfully than ever we lived in the light of the holy trinity the days of his youth were as blameless perhaps as ours morning and evening came and went as to us with their joys and their sorrows their fears and their hopes of manhood and the works of life all that we know is that he was called to be an apostle that he obeyed the call so far perhaps he did more than we have done in corresponding with grace in this grace he persevered in the fellowship of jesus sharing in his toil and weariness hunger and thirst shame and contradiction he heard his parables and saw his mighty works of power what could we have done more he having the purse carried the things that were put therein and the sin of covetousness sprang up in him but the seeds of it are also in us his office led him into the occasions of sin he was tempted and fell and should we have stood firm he was living in the midst of all that ought to have sanctified him without being sanctified by it all without was holy and ministered grace to him but within there was a heart sin which resisted the holy ghost and this spiritual contradiction gradually threw out the habit and the design and the daring by which he fell he had seen his master again and again pass unheard through his enemies they could lay no hand on him he had seen him do works of mighty power how could he doubt that he could protect him from the pharisees what harm to make money where no ill could come jesus could protect himself and so he sold him for thirty pieces of silver not doubting perhaps that the priests and the pharisees were deluding themselves for we read that judas seeing that jesus was condemned repented himself it was a new and unexpected result he went and made restitution casting down the pieces of silver in the temple he himself confessed that he had sinned in betraying the innocent blood have we done as much in many a fall and driven to despair at the unforeseen horror he went and hanged himself judas is an example how a soul once innocent may be slowly changed into the worst sin and even at last fall with little intention of committing the whole evil which follows from its act but if the example of judas be far off from many of us the fall of demas is near to us all we read the pathetic words of st paul demas had left me loving this world he was weary of the apostolic life of journeying by land and by water of having no fixed dwelling place of perils among the heathens and perils among false brethren of labors watchings and fastings why should he be the companion of apostles it was a life of counsels the life of the commandments was enough for such as he how fair and reasonable all this appears how like the reasoning and the lives of many at this day but the apostle saw deeper the holy ghost reads the heart demas loved this world therefore for no other reason he forsook the servants of jesus christ and departed to thessalonica of his end who knows who can know till the day when all falls shall be revealed we shall then know what the apostle said with tears all seek the things that are their own 
not the things that are Jesus Christ's. Let us then meditate often on these things, and remember that falls are not always by the grosser sins which the world takes count of, but by spiritual sins, subtle and secret, which leave no stain upon the outward life, yet are perhaps more deadly because more satanic, that is, more like the fall of angels. Number four, and lastly, let no sun go down without praying for the gift of perseverance. Ask it every day of the ever-blessed Trinity. Ask it of the Eternal Father of whom our Divine Lord had said, No one can snatch them out of the hand of my Father. Ask it of the Eternal Son incarnate who has said, All that the Father giveth to me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will not cast out. Ask it also of the Eternal Spirit, the Holy Ghost, for our Lord has also said, No man can come to me except the Father who has sent me draw him. It is by the Holy Ghost which proceedeth from the Father and the Son that Jesus fulfills his promise. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all things to myself. This is the gift of perseverance, the manifold grace of the ever-blessed Trinity, encompassing us without and penetrating and sustaining us within and upholding us above our dangers and ourselves. Ask it through the prayers of our Blessed Mother, the Mother of God, whose immaculate hands are lifted up day and night before the sacred heart of her Son, to obtain our salvation. And finally, ask it through the prayers of our guardian angel, who has kept us from our baptism in spite of all infidelities and all the griefs and disappointments we have heaped upon him. And then, onwards and upwards, onwards against the resistance, both within and without, which hinders our advance in the life of God onwards without fear or doubt or wavering, and upwards aiming as high as we can, for we have to ascend the mountains of the Lord's house, which are exalted very high. We have three mountains to scale before we see the vision of peace. The first is Mount Calvary, by the way of the cross, in penance, mortification, and self-denial, sharp indeed, but sweet when we remember our sins and the love of Jesus. For this end I have endeavored to speak of the sacrament of penance as an object of love, that souls may be drawn to it as their true rest, refreshment, and consolation. The second is Mount Tabor, the mountain of the Beatitudes, in which Jesus reveals himself to hearts purified on Calvary, that is, in the sacrament of the altar, in which Jesus stands surrounded by the meek, the merciful, the clean of heart, the persecuted for justice' sake, blessing and changing them into his own likeness. And the last mountain is Mount Sion, upon which is the holy city and the vision of God. To this we are called. Jesus is ever saying, Come up hither, ever promising to us a crown of perseverance. A few short years, and a little sorrow, and a few conflicts, and perhaps some falls, and a generous repentance with a loving reparation. Then comes the end, eternal rest, and the vision of beauty and of peace. He that shall overcome shall thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that shall overcome, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. 
to him that shall overcome i will give to sit with me in my throne as i also have overcome and am set down with my father in his throne end of chapter five end of the love of jesus to penitence by henry edward manning